So I'd like to welcome you to another installment of our series, The Power of Pivoting, Managing Through Crisis, the HSS Response to the COVID-19 Pandemic. I'm Dr. Ronald McKenzie, an internist and rheumatologist at the Hospital for Special Surgery, and I've served as the moderator for these discussions. So today we have three of the frontline participants uh, in the uh, HSX experience who will share their insights into what they have lived through over the last six weeks. Uh, we have Dr. Greg Liguori, who's the director of the Department of Anesthesiology, Critical Care, and pain management, our anesthesiologist in chief, who I would say his job just got a lot bigger. Um, Megan Kirksey, uh, also an attending, um, assistant attending anesthesiologist here, who is also board certified in critical care medicine. And Jawad Sela, a clinical pharmacologist at HSS who works closely with the ICU team, who will share with us some of his insights regarding the challenges of pharmacological management in these patients. So welcome to all three of you. Thanks, Ron. So Greg, maybe you can tell us a little bit about the experience of the last six or eight weeks, uh, how the Department of Anesthesiology had to uh, respond to this um, um, uh, pandemic. Sure. The uh, it was a very interesting and challenging time, uh, and what I uh, witnessed and was a part of uh, was a transformation of HSS from uh, an elective orthopedic surgical hospital into uh, two entities, an, an acute care trauma, tra uh, orthopedic trauma hospital and an intensive care unit uh, dominated facility. So these are things that were are generally within our realm of expertise. Uh, obviously, orthopedic trauma is something that we've done, but not to the level that we did. Uh, and then a critical care, we're very fortunate about 10 years ago to, uh, to uh, open a, an ICU here at HSS, a small ICU, a four-bedded ICU, and recruit uh, six to eight intensive care uh, specialists in anesthesia. So we had some uh, background in these areas, but uh, we, we went from a four-bed ICU into a 36-bed or potential up to a 36-bed ICU, uh, increasing the capacity many hundreds percent uh, from what we were used to. And we were used to taking care of orthopedic critical care, which is uh, short-term mechanical ventilation, mild arrhythmias, uh, fat emboli syndrome, pulmonary emboli, to uh, what we're seeing in the COVID world, which is severe respiratory lung disease. And, um, and uh, I'm very, very proud of the team, how they stepped up and, uh, and did this transformation. Things like this would normally occur over months to years, and, uh, and our team did it in a week or two. Can you tell us a little bit about the transformation of the space? How did you turn and what did you turn into ICUs? So our four bedded ICU on the fifth floor here, uh, we decided to maintain that as a non-COVID facility to take care of all the patients, the trauma patients and other patients that we were looking into uh, who did not have uh, COVID uh, to maintain that space. So that uh, left us a few challenges. And what we ultimately decided to do was take the ninth floor uh, which was our ambulatory surgery center, and convert the eight operating rooms there into each one a two-bedded ICU. And that uh, inc increased or uh, expanded our capacity to 16 patients upstairs. Um, it was a, uh, uh, an engineering feat to get the airflow correct. You wanted to make sure air was flowing in the correct direction from a clean area to a dirty area. Uh, there was a tremendous amount of education that had to go on in terms of how to move between the areas, what we call donning and doffing of personal protective equipment, and then uh, the care of these patients. Uh, we, uh, we then uh, realized quickly that uh, 16 beds were not enough. And we then took the PACU and uh, quite literally within two days created, uh, had a construction team in there, again, worrying about airflow and, um, and uh, spacing between patients and created another uh, 16 bays in there. So um, 
Uh, it, was, it happened very, very quickly, but it had a lot of planning. A lot of individuals were involved. It's not just creating the space, it's creating the infrastructure in terms of, in terms of pharmacy, nursing, um, respiratory therapy, where the um, ventilators would go. And, and speaking of ventilators, we did not have enough ventilators, so we uh, transformed our, our anesthesia machines, which have ventilators, into, uh, into long, longer term ventilators. And, and that took some uh, some uh, jerry-rigging and, and some work to do, but uh, the team stepped up and took care of all that. They actually work uh, relatively well as surrogate ventilators? Yeah, the newer, the older anesthesia machines, and we, we have a, a fleet here of different ages, the older ones have limited ventilatory capacity, but the new anesthesia machines, and we have 15 or 20 of those, have uh, almost all the capacity of, of, uh, of good uh, ICU ventilators. And uh, so we were able to do all the ventilatory management that, that these patients would need, or almost all of it. And so we never reached the point then where we had to consider this two-for-one concept that there was a lot of discussion around. Yeah. I take it that didn't really, in the end, work out? No, it, we did not have to uh, split ventilators, things yeah. like that. Uh, but again, in the early days, we had plans for that because we just didn't know what to expect. And the models showed anywhere from a few hundred thousand to several million patients sure. and uh, needing tremendous numbers of ICU beds. So we, we overbuilt a little bit in the, in the PACU. We never filled the PACU of patients, uh, but it was there just in case. So we saw the surge come and, uh, and go, and uh, waxed and waned, and uh, we were able to maintain patients uh, individually on ventilators. So I'm going to talk to Megan a little bit about the challenges of that, but one before we get to that, just so that the audience understands, these patients were um, essentially transferred here from the New York Hospital, right, in varying degrees of distress. Uh, that's correct. So, <clears throat> uh, since we don't have an emergency room, we weren't bringing our patients, patients weren't coming here directly. Now, COVID turned out to be an interesting uh, disease, uh, and it's, it, it, we're learning more and more about it. And a few of our intensivists, Megan was one of them, spent some time over at NYP before we took our patients here. So we learned a lot about what was going on. And one interesting aspect that we learned was that when a patient comes into the emergency room, they, they, it takes a few days for them to declare themselves, whether they're going to be mildly sick and just require a few days of a mechanical ventilation or very, very sick and go into multi-organ system failure. So um, we don't have the, uh, the facilities here to deal with the multi-organ system failure, um, dialysis, things like that. So we wanted to see the patients declare themselves, sort of, as much as we can over at NYP before bringing them here. So they were usually at NYP for a few days, and it looked like they were relatively stable of the unstable group, and those are the ones we brought here. So Megan, tell us a little bit of what it was like looking after these patients and what you learned about this uh, disease entity. Um, <clears throat> the most overwhelming and challenging aspect of managing COVID-19 ICU patients is how little anyone knows about the disease. Uh, the pathogenesis, the prognostic factors, who's going to do well, who's not, what are the best ways to intervene to manage the complications that you're seeing, uh, even if, you, if you're lucky enough to have a sense of the uh, source of those complications. And so everyone, I think nationwide, around the world, is learning on the fly the best ways that you can possibly manage these patients. I've worked in a very high acuity ICUs before, up at Columbia in cardiothoracic ICU, at Memorial with cancer patients, a lot of whom had terminal diagnoses. So we've been in high acuity situations before, but what's different about COVID is, is how little we understand and how dramatically patients' conditions can change uh, without any uh, forewarning. And so there are a lot of experimental therapies that have been mentioned in the news that I'm sure everyone has heard about who's not working directly on them, uh, determining which patients may be the best ones who could potentially benefit from these interventions was one major challenge. Uh, and then with the small numbers that we had, it was difficult to even ascertain if those interventions made any any difference at all. And I think it's going to be months before the literature starts coming out of the larger institutions to give us a, a more of a sense of what we might be able to do better. 
uh, even the remdesivir trial that was recently reported in the news. Although it's promising and we're excited to grab onto anything that seems to be helpful, at the end of the day, the data shows that it reduced hospital stay by three days with no statistical significant impact on mortality. So we're still pretty far behind the curve in terms of finding a, w a way to treat these patients. Um, and that, uh, honestly, is, is a big uh, burden on both the patients and the families who don't know what to expect, but it's also different for the healthcare providers who are in a situation where you know, we do this job because we really want to be able to help. You know, and people were very eager to get involved. People like uh, Dr. Ligori mentioned, before we even opened our ICU here, we're going over to NYP to volunteer their time to serve in whatever way is possible. And to do that uh, and then still see patients who are decompensating in a way that, that you can't that you can't manage it was, is, was a real um, emotional and cognitive strain on a lot of the staff too. And I think that's something that doesn't get discussed much in the management of these patients. Um, but it, it, was a, it was a big challenge to manage them clinically and to maintain the morale of the team and to try to maintain every, the mental health of the providers during this course. One thing I can say is that the, administ the level of administrative support during this surge was phenomenal. The fact that we were able to do these things while not having to worry about availability of PPE was is game changing. The fact that there were so many people behind the scenes making sure that we could get the IT updates that we needed, the physical equipment, because when you're managing uh, patients in an ICU with a dangerous infectious disease, we want to minimize the amount of time that nurses are in the room. We want to minimize the amount of time that any clinicians have to be exposed while at the same time maximizing care. And so being able to get cameras into the room so that we could communicate with nurses from outside so that nurses can and uh, physicians outside of the room can see what's going on at the bedside, especially in these operating rooms that aren't configured uh, with windows so that you can see the monitors from outside. We started out with baby monitors so we could listen in and then it upgraded to cameras over the course of a week or two. Ultimately, we were able to get uh, tablets into the room so that families could FaceTime with the patients as well. Um, basically everything that we said that we needed on the clinical side was accomplished on the leadership and administrative side in, in a way that was quite remarkable. So did, did you feel uh, during this experience that, um, that the expression of the disease changed in any way or was it a relatively predictable pattern once someone, for instance, was locked into being on a ventilator? It was completely unpredictable. This disease is completely unpredictable. There are patterns that you see, and, but we don't have a good sense of who's going to go in what direction. You know, there are lots of people who have been exposed, had no symptoms, testing positive for antibodies, seem to have cleared it without an issue. There are people who get very sick at home, never need to be hospitalized. People who come into the hospital, hospital, we still don't have a good sense of who is going to end up in an ICU and if there's a way to prevent that. And then once they come to us intubated, there's not a good sense of who is going to recover and who's not. It, in our small sample of patients, we had a 91-year-old intubated for a few days, extubated, recovered, went to the floor, and you know, a uh, patient in their 50s who, with no comorbidities who, who passed away. And you just, you, there's no way to make that call ahead of time. We had a patient who was not waking up, had been intubated for four weeks, Lungs seemed to recover, but did not appear to have much in the way of cognitive function left, was not clear at all, didn't look like he would survive an extubation, but had expressed that he would not want to be intubated long term. The decision was made with the family to remove the breathing tube. We removed the breathing tube. With the expectation he wasn't going to survive. With the expectation he would not survive. And he woke up and he was able to maintain his ventilation. And he was on FaceTime talking to his family that afternoon and went to the step down unit. This was a man in his mid 70s. On the other hand, we had a man in his late 50s who looked, it was about three weeks in, lungs looked a lot better, extubated, spoke to his family. The next day, abruptly, uh, lost the ability to oxygenate. We think maybe it was a 
blood clot, even though he was on full dose anticoagulation, and he passed away within a couple of days. So, and there's just no way for us to know ahead of time how that's going to go. And that's very difficult um, for us, but again, of course, devastating for the families when it doesn't go the way that you hope that it will. So what about the deployment of personnel? I mean, perhaps both of you could respond to this a little bit, but clearly you found yourselves uh, working with a, a variety of individuals who may not have had ICU background, but nonetheless were performing very important supportive type functions. So what we did uh, initially was we leveraged the knowledge and skill of our intensive care group uh, who were working very hard around the clock here and on the unit. Uh, and um, with, we leveraged their abilities with OR anesthesiologists. So uh, for every intensivist, we had two or three OR anesthesiologists. And they would do procedures, uh, arterial lines, central lines, intubations, uh, and transfers to and from New York Presbyterian. So uh, these are individuals who are skilled uh, at, at medical and, and critical care type things, but not don't have the knowledge that our ICU group had. So that was one very, very important group. Um, Another very important group for us were our CRNAs. Uh, in order to become a CRNA, a certified registered nurse anesthetist, in order to become a CRNA, you have to have several years of ICU nursing. Uh, and so here at HSS, there are very few true ICU nurses. So they played a critical role in educating and supporting uh, the nurses uh, for the unit, uh, on, for the patients, uh, right there in the unit. So we had anywhere from four to six CRNAs on the unit at any given time. And they worked, uh, they're very comfortable with the anesthesia machine ventilators, and they're very comfortable in ICU settings. So as a liaison between the, the physicians, ICU, and the nurses, they were terrific. Um, there were a, a number of other individuals. We have PAs and nurse practitioners who, who managed the patients and, and did what they always do. Uh, we had a surgical residents, uh, who, uh, orthopedic residents who acted as interns and took a few patients each and, and really, really honed their skills and, and uh, took care of those patients. And uh, surgeons came on the units. And um, as Megan and some of the other uh, ICU uh, uh, doctors have said, some of the surgeons here were the best interns they've ever had. So uh, really, really smart uh, people who did a tremendous amount of work out of their comfort zone. Um, but that uh, and that group. And, and those are just a few. I mean, uh, a pharmacy was here constantly. Respiratory therapy was here constantly. As Megan pointed out, IT was a huge component of this um, in, uh, in uh, having monitors outside of the, of the danger zone, as it were. So, so anyone who needed to look at a monitor didn't have to gown, mask, and, and, uh, and put on full PPE so we can do things from the outside. So, um, and the list goes on and on. The resources that were made available were incredible. And I cannot, I just want to reiterate the impact, the clinical impact of having the nurse anesthetists in particular available to help with these patients and to help train a nursing staff that wasn't experienced in the ICU was invaluable. Because a lot of what needed to be done to keep these patients alive was ventilator endotracheal tube management that no no one else is comfortable doing besides the anesthesiologist and the nurse anesthetist. Even uh, the respiratory therapists were excellent, but we had limited numbers of them and they're covering the entire hospital. Uh, the troubleshooting that we had to do for things as we progressed uh, in the course of our unit and in the clinical course of the patients, we ended up with a handful of patients who needed tracheostomies to maintain, to maintain their oxygenation, ventilation, uh, to be able to wake them up and get them off of the ventilator. We've never had a tracheostomy unit of any, of any kind in this hospital. And so nursing education uh, was very involved in this. The respiratory therapist problem solving how to have uh, a relatively filtered tracheostomy weaning protocol so the patients could be suctioned as needed, but also to minimize any aerosolization of COVID from the tracheostomy sites. Everyone teamed up in, in a way that was, that was amazing. There was one other, one other tremendous area that I want to talk about. 
that's very different from a normal ICU. Normal ICUs, the families are there, they come in, they visit, and, and that was just was not able to happen here. And I, can, I just can't imagine how difficult that is for husbands, wives, sons, and daughters uh, to be um, separated by that. And, and the team was very, very busy on the unit taking care of these patients. So communication between the families was, was between the intensivists and the families was by necess necessarily very limited. So we, we set up a, uh, a family medical contact team here, uh, which was the brainchild of a few of our anesthesiologists, um, uh, Mandeep Kalsi and, and uh, Mary Chisholm. And we basically had some of our anesthesiologists who, for whatever reason, health or age, were not on the front line. They were taking a back seat. Uh, but they sort of adopted patients, read through their charts, communicated with the ICU team, and were in constant communication daily with the families. Um, through the help of service excellence here and uh, and that team, so I think I think we we took a really really bad situation for the families and made it maybe a little bit better through that communication, um, which really isn't done as much uh, in other ICUs. No, I think that was a, a very very important function, and we actually had Mandeep and Mary here and oh, have okay. interviewed oh, them, great. so uh, their efforts are not going to go unacknowledged uh, by this series okay. as well. So I'd like to bring Jawad into this a little bit um, and, you know, and, and maybe just set the stage for this portion of the discussion by um, just making the audience aware that there are uh, many, many challenges with respect to the treatment of these patients, uh, particularly from a pharmacologic standpoint. I mean, you've probably heard through the news about the use of medications such as the anti-malarials or Zithromax and so on, but when these patients get sick, really sick, apart from those kinds of treatments. There are all sorts of uh, other considerations. They develop these thrombotic or blood clotting problems and need to be put on um, blood thinners. Uh, they, of course, can develop secondary pneumonias, pneumonias related to bacteria, for instance, or even fungi, potentially, that, have, uh, that are not the virus. And then, of course, there are the antiviral therapies. And even there are uh, the, the kidney problems that these patients get, which sometimes leads to dialysis results and the need to uh, adjust the dosing of many of these medications so as to not injure the kidney further or to not overdose the patient in relative terms with a medicine, for instance, that's excreted by the kidney. So enter Jawad. Yeah. Um, before we begin, I'd just like to say that I'm proud and privileged to be working with this critical care team that I've worked with for many years. Um, they were the nucleus of this ICU. They did not sleep throughout the entire time. And um, uh, with that being said, it's not just critical care. Everyone was involved. Um, as Dr. Lagori said, uh, watching nurses in there, the compassion of holding the patient's hands singing happy birthday to some of these patients when their birthday came around. Um, <clears throat> it was amazing having some of these uh, attending orthopedic surgeons that were there, Dr. Galata, Dracos, um, uh, you know, just to name a few. It was, it was absolutely amazing to see that culture and dynamic that we have here. <clears throat> so with pharmacy, there's two portions here. You have your operational and your clinical side, right? And so from the operational side, just to say a few, you know, to mention a few things, we had to make sure um, that we're team players and we can help the healthcare staff and the nurses um, with the least amount of exposure or contamination that they can get. So with that being said, we had to increase privileges um, with our pharmacists to make sure that we time all the medications for 10 a.m. and 10 p.m. Um, uh, with that being said, so the nurses could go in and administer all the meds at the same time and not have to go in and out to get these medications. Strategically placing Pixis machines and Omni cells that our nurses use, our CRNAs and our anesthesia department use, um, we had to position them in clean areas. Um, Can you it, explain just what those machines So these are, are uh, automatic dispensing cabinets. These are machines, um, when an order is placed, in order to remove the medication, you go into this machine, um, sign in, go through the patient, pick the patient's name, and the drawer opens up to remove the medication. What I did prior to this, since we had a head start, was call other institutions that were uh, dealing with this, uh, other pharmacy departments and critical care teams, et cetera, and what we found was there was a lot of contamination with these machines. 
they were placed, they weren't prepared, and they placed them in what we call dirty corridors or dirty areas, uh, or inside of the rooms. Uh, and what that can do is cause uh, mass contamination, because how does a pharmacist or technician refill that machine? Um, how do we even go in and out? And these medications that are returned back into the machine, um, with all these shortages that we're dealing with, how do we, you know, do we throw those medications out? Do we sequester them? Do we put them away for a week, three days, depending on the material that you know they're packaged in? So that was a big challenge in the beginning. How, where do we place these machines, and how do we strategically place them in places that we that will you know with the least contamination or exposure? So helping nurses with that, helping with, um, for example, uh, uh, glucose control uh, at, for diabetics. Right. Uh, what we had to do is talk 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 to endo or talk to our diabetes MP. Uh, Ruben and discuss having longer acting regimens, uh, 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 you know, t Levimir or, or Lantus, 10 a.m. or 10 p.m., and adding possibly uh, Umalog four times a day and decreasing our finger sticks. These are just examples of what we did to try to minimize exposure uh, and uh, be team players and help our, our staff. Um, so shortages were a huge deal. What did we do with emergencies? With, these, with this patient population, you had, you had a lot more of signal ones, code blues, as you call it. And what we did to try to minimize opening up our carts, which we, you know, our emergency trays every you know, couple hours, couple times a day, we created these emergency packs that we put inside of the rooms that had these first line medications in these emergencies uh, so they can open them up in the room and not have to come out. We created RSI packs, rapid sequence intubation packs that we put in Pixis machines. We enhanced the override lists. You can remove it whenever you'd like. These are some examples from an operational standpoint. From a clinical standpoint, we were lucky enough to be part of a hospital that specialized in rheumatology. Uh, we had supply uh, some rheumatological medications that helped with uh, this disease. Uh, this disease can be attacked from multiple angles. One could be decreasing viral replication. Um, uh, the other, you know, and sometimes decreasing viral replication um, has to do with acid base and, you know, acidity or, you know, um, within the cell. Um, decreasing protein binding. Uh, the other huge one where rheumatology plays a big part is the cytokine storm, which seems to occur, um, it fluctuates. Uh, like Megan said, we really don't know when this happens. Uh, technically, they say you, know, you could either, like tocilizumab, you can give it um, when they're on uh, nasal cannula or the, they don't non-invasive O2 and they start to decline rapidly and based on their levels, whether it's ferritin or their interleukin-6, et cetera, um, how to block some of these agents like interleukin-6, et cetera. And so, we were lucky enough to have the rheumatology team, and Dr. Crow played a pivotal part in this, and getting her team to rapidly have um, uh, IRB access and expedite some of these studies that we had in place. And some of them weren't even part of trials, we just had them in stock uh, to give. Uh, the Compassionate Use Program, we uh, had some remdesivir that we had on site for these patients. Uh, and Plaquenil, we didn't use much of because it was given earlier on uh, when they were in the ED. Um, and then from an antimicrobial stewardship perspective, we had Dr. Miller, who led the charge on this, Dr. Henry as well, um, where we were trying to uh, create a protocol and so that we had some sort of control over what we're giving to what patients uh, in this cowboy setting, as you call it. It was just out of control because uh, we are so used to using evidence-based medicine and there is no evidence for anything. So it made it very tough uh, and it was risk versus benefit and who made these decisions. Um, you know, initially with this disease state, there were super infections. They like to give antibiotics for everyone. Uh, moving forward, we realized that if there's no true source of infection, bacterial infection, um, we were not giving empiric therapy. Uh, in the New York Presbyterian, they started off by giving, you know, medications like ceftriaxone and doxycycline for community-acquired pneumonia. When they came in here, they, took, they did that for five days and then that lost favor. When they were in here, they seemed like they had, and remember, these patients have multiple lines. You have ventilator-associated pneumonia, you have hospital-acquired pneumonia, you have clapsy, you have cauli. So a lot of times you have to, it not, might not just be the virus, they're hooked up to all of these lines. What are we treating when it comes to antimicrobial treatment? So this was a huge 
challenge. And <clears throat> although it was scary, um, you know, if you love this stuff, it could, it could be somewhat cool <laughs> if you like to be the front line, but it's, it's scary stuff and watching yourself fail sometimes could really hurt you as a person. And with that being said, you know, administration, one thing I do want to say to piggyback what Megan said was, every single day at around 3 p.m., the CNO would pass by, Jen O'Neill. Brian Kelly would be in that unit regularly, and Lou Shapiro. And seeing the leadership in the hospital rotate and ask us how we are doing on a regular basis, meant the world because you didn't feel alone because transparency here was huge. Everyone thought the world's ending. So to have leadership around was, was huge. And you know, like I said, it was tough. You needed everyone, whether it was IT, engineering was huge. Mm -hmm. The units were different. You had your operating rooms in which the rooms were huge. We moved all the unicells out, mm -hmm. the omnicells. You had that specific room that was structured differently than an open suite which was the ninth floor patio. The open suite now was beds all in one area side by side with HEPA filters placed where they built in walls for isolation and the DOF the area had positive pressure so the nurses could come in and the machines were stationed. So it was a lot, there was a lot involved, everyone was involved and it, for us mm -hmm. to come together like this was amazing. As an orthopedic hospital that does a lot of work related to sports, there's a lot of conversation about what teamwork means. And the amount of teamwork that went into making this function to ramp up the kind of surge capacity that we did to do something that we've never done before and to transition so quickly from a phase of acute patients to where we're becoming chronic uh, ICU patients to manage them as they transition to what's more of an LTAC, uh, long-term acute care uh, level of care, was amazing. And then to move now into the new normal and transition through has required everybody to work at every level. And one group of people that was essential on in the ICU that uh, very rarely gets mentioned is, is the role of the unit assistants on that floor. And they were in those rooms every day helping uh, to make sure that everything was clean and sterile and putting themselves at risk to manage these patients, really behind the scenes even from our view because they were often stationed in, in the dirty corridor uh, to be available to the nurses in the room to, to bring them things as they needed them and to bring uh, soiled materials out as, as were needed. And I, I really want to express appreciation for that side of the team too because they really stepped up. They also came into the room to help with repositioning patients to minimize the impact of bed sores. Um, so there's an active role in the clinical care that that was um, essential as well. So. Well, listen, thank you all very much for this really engaging discussion and uh, for everything you've done for the patients. Thanks, Good. Ron. Thanks for coming. Thanks.